from 1953. We already talked about a couple films from 1953. But with Fritz Lang explosive noir, it catapulted not only for B-movies, but it, uh, the argument is, is B-movies now become the A-movies. Mm. And it was such a monster hit for, for Columbia Pictures that it kind of put the spotlight, which they don't like, on noirs. Mm, that's true. Which almost was like... Hey, um, everybody likes us. It's one of those things. <laughs> now, now we got to figure it out. So today we're going to talk about Fritz Lang's Big Heat, what works and what doesn't. Welcome back to the show, everybody. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gilwithy from GoatFilmReviews.com. Hi, everybody. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast, and thanks for watching. Thanks for following us. And for our loyal fans, thank you for continuing to support the show. You can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram. Yes, we do have a Patreon. Check that out for some great deals and opportunities to tell us what movies we can review in the future. Both Kyle and I are members of the Minnesota Film Critics Alliance. Check that out uh, webpage for critics' reviews as well as ours. And today we're talking about the big noir hit of 1953, Fritz, Fritz Lang's The Big Heat. All right. When tough but fair cop Dave Banyan discovers the possibility right. that members of the police may be on mobster payrolls, he attempts to take on the gangster syndicate. During his investigation, the criminals hit back at Banyan, leaving him as a man with nothing left to lose. This is a serial short. It was posted on the Saturday Evening Post, mm -hmm. um, written by William McGovern, William P. McGovern, I think. Mm -hmm. did a lot of very, very salty crime stories as you can tell from this one. Mm. And then the screenplay was adapted by Sidney, I would say, Bohm. Bohm, I think. Bohm. Yeah. And I think he got an award for it, for the adaptation for a screenplay. Uh, yeah, the film, be, the whole thing about it is it's kind of weird because Sidney Bohm is known for a couple of really great screenplays. Originally, the, for his own reasons. The criticism of this one in particular is that you didn't really have to do much because there's a lot of, like, taken right out of the serial and then eventual novel taken yeah. right out of their dialogue and sequences and all he did was kind of trim the fat and made it fit into a, a smaller time frame but what he doesn't what people don't understand is that's really hard to do in adaptation it's to slim down things to cut things out of an adaptation <laughs> because you cut down the right wrong thing right yeah the you, whole could, temple, you could topple the whole story you right, know? And the whole temple tone gets eroded um, and of course it's Fritz Lane and this is he's one of those came from Germany during uh, you know when during the Nazi, mm -hmm. came over to do films for America. He was actually one of the few that actually could work into the studio system very well. Obviously, Eric Stronheim couldn't do it. Ron Stronheim couldn't. Didn't work. Most of them had a lot. F.W. Murnau <laughs> didn't struggled with the studio system, but Fritz understood that you work with the studio first, rather than putting your personal flavor in front. Yeah, because a lot of people have looked at the Big Heat as like it's more like a Fritz Lang question mark. Like, yeah. because of things like working on M and Metropolis and all right. these elements that we would think, like, okay, well, that obviously, like, that's his kind of film. Right. But then yeah. you see the big heat and you're like, what the heck? Huh. <laughs> I'll get to a little more in my review of it later. Mm -hmm. So this is Columbia Pictures. Understand, when Columbia, we work for Columbia Pictures, cheap. They're notorious for being cheap, constantly reusing sets and under a 90-minute film. Mm. You got to work in none of those conditions. A lot of directors that we mentioned, like F.W. F. Murnau, Eric von Stronheim, and a lot of other directors from Germany, couldn't run a, work under those restraints. Yeah. I think Fritz was able to be a little more adaptable, and I get to review about that a little bit later on. Um, also, you have Gloria Graham, who comes back after she was in The Bad and the Beautiful. Yeah, almost not in this film because they really wanted to get Marilyn Monroe, but the other studio wouldn't right. release her for that price tag that they were offering. So, right, another one of. Yeah, Gloria Graham's career is always, well, we can't get X. Well, we get Gloria Graham. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, after this movie, uh, Glenn Ford and her would do another movie with Fritz Lang called Human Desire. Hopefully mm. we'll critique that a little to, uh, later. Because okay. it's a different flavor. Same ingredients, but you get a different thing coming out of the oven. Yeah, it almost seems like Fritz Lang was, w was really into telling certain genres, but then he could work in just about any other one. Yes. You know, because it does seem like when you view things like Ammon Metropolis, that's that's the Fritz Lang that is basically choosing his project. But in Hollywood, like you pointed out, especially at this time, it was a machine, and you were just lucky if you got some really great movies out of that machine. And yeah. and Fritz Lang was very a capable of at maneuvering through it. And especially when a lot of people, the studio system collapsed under them. Yeah. 
Um, okay. And then you have, of course, a bad guy, which this is one of his first movies being a bad guy. Mm. And coming a long line of being a bad guy, you have Lee Marvin. Again, <laughs> just playing Lee Marvin. And that's not a fault. You know, we just, yeah. you know, on, on our Patreon, we just talked about uh, Snake Eyes, and Nick Cage is always playing Nick Cage in that movie. This is Lee Marvin still playing Lee Marvin. <laughs> right, right. There's no range to Lee Marvin. He's going to punch you in the nose or he's going to pull you out of Now, that right being place. said, when you cast Lee Marvin and you want him to play Lee Marvin, he does a pretty damn good job. Yeah, so there's and then, no then with his henchman, he's got like a weird noir guy's name, like Vic Stone or something. Vince like. Stone. Vince Stone, right. <laughs> you got to be a bad guy with the name Vince Stone. Right. Which I kind of enjoy this movie. But that, yeah, they always have those characters named. Bannon seems the right fit for a protagonist. Doesn't seem too sh like Brock. Doesn't yeah. seem too, more, too much like a Terry. A Bannon fits right down the middle. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And he's Dave. Which, no fault if your name is Dave. But Dave is not an intimidating name. No. Bannon is not an intimidating name. Uh, Which neither is, is Glenn. It's almost like you can, get, you can push him around a little bit before. Yeah. Right. And I think part of that is the choice of Glenn Ford. They're not picking a, you know, like I, I referred to it in our discussion, tough but fair, because really, like, he's not an intimidating force until he is lit like a fuse, you know? So, uh, with No Roar Alley, Eddie Muller critiqued this movie, and he called it the Dirty Harry of the Eisenhower era. Hmm. Where Banyan goes dirty hairy on everybody after the events that transpire in the story. Yeah. And I have to kind of agree with him because it's kind of the catalyst of almost dirty hairy before we get dirty hairy. Well, and especially the, you know, the sequence, we're not going to spoil anything before our review, but uh, the, the sequence in question there where he basically says, I'll give you my badge, but not my gun. I love how in any normal current film, we would see that it's like, well, that's stupid. That wouldn't work. And in this film, they're like, okay. Yeah, take, you know, like, take my badge. Just, I'm, that's I'm keeping the gun. And he's like, okay, all right, no problem there. Cool. And so already we talked about a couple of, of the four East Noirs. By 53, is kind of almost vaporing away. Mm. And with this movie, it's almost like brought it back in because people were kind of interested in looking at other stuff. you got color films. You've got musicals. There's television to compete with. You can watch TV nowadays. Mm -hmm. And the whole aesthetic of noir is almost tapering off here. And it was almost like this kind of gets reviewed. And I think it's in the right appropriation as the last really grasp to get people to, the last to attempt a big boom of noir being the spotlight. Well, it has a few things to it that you generally don't see. And so I, I think more classic fans of noir may not catch the certain elements that they really like here because yeah. it does kind of change things specifically around like I've found that every film noir I've watched seems to have some conspiracy that you kind of can't make heads or tails of until you put down a little right. diagram a discombobulated script is yeah like, but the yeah. point is confusion in, in sometimes right. this film is very straight laced every sequence you know exactly where all the characters are and where they stand it is a chess board that is constantly being reset on board and there, I'm sure if you put the camera down everybody's spot to stand is right there They're exactly right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there is a forward trajectory on every character arc in the film that is yeah. not forgotten not overlooked it's not a it's about the characters but it's just as much about the story here and it's very much does not look organic. Everybody looks like they're doing a, a stage theater play. Yeah, almost. there's a couple moments when Glenn Ford is spectacularly brightly lit. Like, right. impossibly bright inside of their home. <laughs> you know? So we'll get to my review because it doesn't have a lot of components we see very much in noirs. Not a lot of events take place at night. Not a lot of shadows. We kind of have a clear, coherent story. Um, and then we have kind of brightly but boring stage sets. There's really nothing to play with the background to set the mood. It very, looks very clear and boring almost. And I think, yeah. well, I think it starts that way. The but I direction. think that's because Glenn Ford is playing a very boring person at the beginning. Right. You know, this does feel like, I, I was thinking not just Dirty Harry, I was thinking Death Wish. I was thinking right, yeah. know, those kinds of a characters where like, they live a pretty boring life before they have to like you know, I'm a just a boring architect, or then I then my wife gets murdered. Yeah, right. and it's Death like Wish. Death Wish has that kind of idea where it's like Charles Bronson is like that guy's boring. Five minutes later, I'm gonna follow that guy. <laughs> you know. Okay, so up next is our review, and this is the first time Kyle's seen it. The 
fake heat. So if you're interested in Noirs and everything, I would recommend the DVD or the Blu-ray. In the back there is some commentaries by Martin Scorsese as well as Michael Mann talking about the movie in a historical context and they're kind of the influences on their own works. Very interesting to listen about filmmakers talk about this movie as well. Yeah, definitely. That's yep. the Indicator Blu-ray. Um, yep. And it was, yeah, it was a really nice presentation. I have not watched a lot of Indicator Blu-rays, so I wasn't sure about the company, but after seeing this presentation, I was like, yeah, I could own some of those. So, <laughs> so like I always throw it to him, first time watching, Kyle. What did you think overall with the review of The Big Heat? So I'm having a really hard time. I'm having Literally. a really hard time with this movie because I want to tell you right now that it's my favorite noir film that you've ever brought to me. Okay. But I'm worried I'm forgetting something. So at the very least, <laughs> it's one of my favorite noirs right. that you've ever brought to the table. Okay. Um, one of I, I was blown away by this movie. I love this thing. Um, it starts... Bam! It, it does yeah. start bam, but really, Literally la bam, the right? movie didn't win me over until its spoiler moment, until it's that sequence takes the place. The second act, what happens. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when that takes place, I was like, no, you didn't just do that. Like, no, and, and not only that, the sequence itself could be comical if you, because the whole house kind of has this moment. Right, <laughs> and the camera shanks. Yeah, and, and you're it doing it very really much, comical. you're dancing on cliches too, because he's in the kids' room. Yep being the best dad in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the whole sequence there, I was I was like, you didn't just do what I think you did, right? And then the next scene shows up, and it's like, oh, God. Like, this is our fuse. This is our moment. This is our, our death wish. <laughs> right. Fuse is a perfect step because everybody has a catalyst of a fuse. What is going to push their buttons to the point that they're going to lash out back? Yeah. You have uh, something like the villain Vince Stone, who obviously murdered Lucy Chapman. We know because she was had cigarette burns on her, mm. and then he puts throw, burns coffee on his girlfriend Gloria Graham. But then he puts cigarette burns on the other person, and so we know kind of his signature thing of burning. Yeah. At this point, and to get some retaliation, we have Dave Banyan. His view is this started with the, the big explosion. Yeah, and almost you, all the violence in the film really is sparked by heat. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and part of that is, you know, simply a cliche thing where even gunfire is smoking usually at the end of it. So, like, there is always that level of heat to all violence. But in this film, it's, like, perpetuated to a point of, like, everything is on fire all yeah. the time. And it starts with almost like, you, I swear to God, somebody watches. The Omen Part 3. It said, we need to start our movie look just like this. <laughs> With you have a, at the table, you clean up your desk and everything, you put a nice suit on, mm -hmm. and you blow your brains out. <laughs> That's <laughs> fair. Uh, well, I feel like someone did, went forward in time to the Omen 3, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, very much the, like the Omen 3 starts the same way with a, mm. a very... In an office, a suicide. This one starts with an office, but the there's a note, and she uses it as a blackmail catalyst. And it's a whole point of the movie that Banyan's investigating this as suspicious. Yeah. And he's not getting where. And then the top, the you know, people up on the top saying, you need to close this and move on with your life. Yeah. yeah. I think there's an element, too, of Fritz Lang not giving a damn about what the rules are. Because in normal society, when you have that scene... Early on in the film, the guy puts the gun to his head, blows the you know blows his head, and the camera is not is like almost from his perspective, but then it's not. The camera right. moves it's in like, a different way. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like off here. Yeah, and it happens a few times in the film where like we're, I thought we're looking through someone's perspective, and then no, we're not. We're slightly next to it, and it's kind of like him making the decision. I don't care that this isn't your rules. I'm going to tell the story in the way that I think is most evocative of the tale I'm telling. Right, and it's it, this movie's not flashy. Mm -hmm. Noir can be flashy, like Out of the Past or Maltese Falcon. Very flashy, in, in you know. But there's only one really flashy scene: is the introduction of Bannon. You cut the, and he doesn't even have his tie on. Yeah, which I love those little details of Fritz Lang because he doesn't have his tie, and it tells you he just got called to get over there. Yeah, and so it's one of those small little details I love of this movie, and it's because it's it's so simple that you pay attention to those little things. I understand you work with Columbia Pictures that you kind of have can't have a flashy set. You can do bare bones, mm -hmm. but then you could to play with it. Maybe the guy comes in with his nice shirt, you know, suit untied or something like that, and he's the one flashy. He's of course he stands out with all the expensive clothes he wears. Yeah. And so I think that's how he plays. That's where which Fritz Lang works is all right. You want me to do cheap? I'll be flashy somewhere else and mm. use my techniques. That all right? You want me? To, I can't show a suicide. Then let's do something else that annoys. See if it get annoyed with it. I'll say mm -hmm. some kind of reaction, 
to get you going. Because, right, the suicide is weird. It's a weird shot. We don't see anything, but we understand... It's yeah. got its own level of reality that it kind yeah. of builds, and it constructs its own rule book on how this should look and feel, and it doesn't exactly look and feel like that in our reality, but because of the heightened sense of what's going on here, yeah. uh, it seems to work out pretty well. And, course, and that goes to even Glenn Ford, too. Like he, there, There's very rare moments of like that kind of dialogue that you expect from a, a film noir kind of like this. There's yeah. less of that fast-talking high trousers of it all where people are kind of always having a pithy one-liner, Yeah, but it's it's punctuated very well like when I think what I find most interesting is the characters themselves I appreciate and I'm interested and I, I want to see how they come through on the other end so when they drop those moments it really worked well for me right mm -hmm. yeah it's it's almost like he's not really saying out for me for the dialogue is very punchy he's got the he's always got the last line it's always yeah. the best one but for him it's almost aesthetically he's saying I keep going because so many people told me to stop yeah <laughs> so, well but going back to those little punctuations, even like like you'd pointed out of like him pr keeping having the tie off like that. There's the guy that um, that says, "I've got a wife and kids, don't kill me," who d isn't wearing a wedding ring. So I wonder if he's lying about that. Right. Um, there's the woman with the dice in that one scene where you're fixated on the dice and not paying attention to the rest of the film. Fun fact, by the way, the woman holding the dice in that scene is Carolyn Jones, who we just talked about being in House of Wax, who later to Oh Patricia my Adams. God! <laughs> I, I paused, like she looks familiar. Fantastic. I need a second. Um, but like we're fi we're fixated on the dice and not what's going ar on around yeah. them, uh, and I think that's that's evocative of everything. There's the moment where they say like, "Be careful about the coffee; you'll get burned." And da -da. very seriously, like Chekhov's coffee, <laughs> <laughs> right? But it, it's the danger. But the, what I'm trying to say is. Everybody does not come out of this clean. No, everybody. I gets, would doubt there's a single person who comes out of it clean. <laughs> no, to the point that they even know it, and that's when I think Ben is almost like the conscientious character as well, the protagonist. I think he knows we're not. I mean, he gets his job back, but what a heck of a crucible to go through to get your job back. Yeah, I and mean, you're not going to come out of it unscathed. And then you got Gloria Graham's character, who's the revenge count, but you know she gets it in the back as well. Yeah. yeah, there was a number of people that talk about the Gloria Graham scene as being like the shocking moment of, of violence for me, and I, ca I keep going back to that explosion scene because that just really wrecked me. I didn't expect it to happen. Yeah. Um, and that's why I almost felt, I don't want to say underwhelmed by the Gloria Graham scene, but it was something where like my my heart was heightened earlier on in the film. For so Jocelyn when this happened, Brando, I was like, oh yeah. God, we're still, not, like, we're still not coming out with good at the end. Yeah, um, yeah there really is no affectation. There's no one who walks out. Because even at the moment, you mentioned he gets his job back at the end. He does, but when you watch that scene, it is very indicative of what happened at the beginning of the film. But he is a different person at the end. The yeah. performance is different. And I really appreciated Glenn Ford in this movie. Most of my interactions with him were Superman. And then he was in that horror film, Happy Birthday to Me. Um, but, he was, Scott, But he this was. was one where it was just like, I've never seen this him Pete, like this. The, yeah, yeah. Pete Glenn Ford and you won a lot of accolades. I think the other effective thing um, about this movie, after watching this for a review, it shot very basic but almost TV basic it mm -hmm. almost looks like it could be made for television mm. and I think that's another psychological trick I think it's intentional that Fritz did it because you're trying to compete with television okay. why don't you shoot it like a television so the violence looks far more devastating we talked about Psycho was almost shot like a you know for television people that worked on in, you know Helford Hitchcock's TV people yeah, I was thinking movie, about that too. Yeah, and you shot it almost like TV, quick, 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 and just set the table. This looks like it could be made for TV. Mm. Get the TV draw, and I think it's intentional, and that's why the violence is so heightened because you think it's you're almost in a safe environment. Yeah. Another comparison with Psycho is Jeanette Nolan, who's in both films. Um, I was thinking I about yeah, it. like that that very simplistic storytelling, and part yeah. of that too is again, in the fifties, we knew that there was the code about violence. We knew specifically how violence could be portrayed yeah. on film. And part of this is something that we would see two decades later that usually gets attributed to Steven Spielberg and his big shark, which is sometimes what you don't see is scarier than what you do. This film feels way more violent, but there's, yeah. there's I can't very think of any it. violence that even is shown on screen. Yeah. Um, maybe I think one or two of the, the coffee pot things, maybe, but that's the implied violence because we don't even really see the burning. We just see the splashing. <laughs> right. And there's very little flashy other than the mob boss's bedroom. That's flashy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> he does that mon Mr. Burns thing of the phone's ringing and he's standing there waiting for the other guy to answer for him. Yeah, yeah. It's, he's, he, he couldn't have been more Mr. Burns if he wasn't like, excellent. <laughs> okay. So overall, I think it's very important if you love noirs to see the big heat. 
understand aesthetically, like for there's a far more better noirs that do a lot more shadows, but for story content as well as the plot of nobody's going to come out unscathed and that you look good being condemned, this is one of them. Yeah, I like to see characters that go through that transformation where they come out on the other end, not always for the better, but right. they've they've accomplished what they've set out to do, and it that doesn't stain kill is, them. And that yeah. stain's never going to go away. Yeah, coffee on that on that shirt or coffee on that face ain't right. going away. So. And I every, think every it's for especially for a writer, every interaction should have a stain on another character. Mm -hmm. We always talk about the writers' workshop. Some kind of interaction has to leave with that person. And yeah, I think that's a this is a good storyline to understand every interaction leaves a stain with everybody else exactly yeah because yeah. each each interaction is a battle it's a fight it's an action scene of its own yeah. um, and especially when you have code and you have to stick to it <laughs> right. if you can avoid violence and have your action be your words then yeah, it works pretty well so yeah um, of course in 1953 Fitz Lang would do another film another noir called The Blue Gardenia you can check that one out that's on Tubi it mm. uh, doesn't get a lot more accolades than this one does. It'd be kind of nice and kind of interesting to compare both of them. Well, as you yeah. pointed out, the big in the title usually gets your film more. That's it. If you got big in the title. In fact, if you just got the word big, I'm going to like your movie. <laughs> we got to find a movie that you really hate with big in the title. Big uh, business. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's, okay. <laughs> so... Have you seen The Big Heat? My Ch God, you should. Chances are, if you have, you probably enjoyed it because the film currently holds a 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Which does every really? reviewer, all 30 I've never looked. This it does. Film. Yep. Holy it's got a 90% audience, so you're more than likely going to enjoy it. Um, but let us know your thoughts on the film down below. And, uh, you know, like I said, this might be my favorite noir that you brought to the table. If you think you can do better than Nick, let me know what your noir is that you think I'm going to like even more. Okay. Yeah. I think the challenge is to you. So. As Gloria Graham says in this movie, you'll do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if your choice will do. Um, yeah, thank you guys for joining us so very yes, much. You thank can you find all of my film reviews over at goldfilmreviews.com. Of course, and you can find my show, The St. Paul Filmcast, anywhere you find podcasts. <laughs>